So what is, we've now described the, what happens in the natural uh, setting, including what we call uh, the human activities. Let's go in directly, therefore, into human-induced climate change. The human activities, like we said, is changing our climate. And largely as a result of the increase in greenhouse gases. And for example, CO2 comes from the combustion of coal and fossil fuels and deforestation. Let me uh, briefly just describe what happens in deforestation. I'm sure you, you can imagine how simple it is that you ban coal and carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. Any other fuel, fossil fuel, for example, uh, petrol, paraffin, etc. In the case of deforestation, imagine that every time you plant a tree, the tree will be weighing as, as probably about as heavy as your pen, the pen that you use for writing. After about five years, the tree has accumulated a lot of mass, which we call wood. That wood is stored carbon. Every time you burn that carbon, you oxidate it, you oxidate the carbon, and therefore you turn carbon into carbon dioxide. And that smoke that is released into the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere for a very long time. And we'll talk about that later. Similarly, there are activities that lead into emissions of methane. Like every time we build landfill, every time we plant rice, every time we have cattle, as they chew the cud, methane is released. The other gases that come from the human activities is ozone from car exhaust and CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, from aerosols and many other uh, uh, um, uh, uh, applications like uh, fire, like halons, like uh, hydrocarbons, etc. As a result of these human activities, what has happened is the CO2 concentration has increased and is now about 440 parts per million. Imagine that the room you're in had a million particles of air. 770 would be nitrogen or 780,000 would be nitrogen. 210 would be um, thousand would be oxygen because we say there's 78 percent nitrogen, 21 percent oxygen, and there'll be about in the olden past about 280, about 240 parts per million of CO2. So there'll be about 240 parts per million of air of CO2 in the atmosphere. But today we are almost doubled that concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that is what is worrying. It is also worrying the fact that it looks like from historical data, every time the, the CO2 increases, the temperature has also increased. And it's almost all a glove in hand uh, match. And therefore, what is going to happen is every time we increase the amount of CO2, we are also going to get a corresponding, almost a near corresponding increase in the temperatures. And that is what is worrying. But of course, the response time between when the gases are put into the atmosphere and the warming, that the, the changes in the energy and therefore the heat energy, that sometimes has like a, a 
a, a, a few years of a delay, not a few, a, high, a couple of hundreds of years of delay. A, and therefore, we're going to see this warming continue rising uh, f uh, and warming very fast and into very high temperatures in the near future. That, that is what is worrying, that every time we have uh, increases in CO2 in the past, we've had increases in temperature. This is what history has taught us for the last 800,000 years be before today. So let's look at what has happened in here. If you put in CO2 today, it will reside in the atmosphere for about 100 years. If you put in methane, it will be about there for 12 years, etc. Look at some of these uh, chlorofluorocarbons, that some of them, their residence time in the atmosphere goes all the way up to about 3,000 years, 700 years for nitrogen trifluoride. So it is important for us to know that even some of the human activities that we undertake now, their impact is going to last very long in time in the, in the, in, in the future. And also important is this fact, the global warming potential. We assign carbon dioxide as one. It's a unit of measurement. When we do that, it shows that methane is about 25% much more potent than carbon dioxide. CFC 12, chlorofluorocarbon 12, largely used in the refrigeration sector, is at about 11,000 times more potential, more potent than carbon dioxide. That means if you had one ton of CFC 12, it would do as much damage as 11,000 tons of CO2. These are very important issues that you must remember, that if you're going to start negotiating on the climate change, you have the scientific basis on which you are going to negotiate. Again, it is important to note that in the atmosphere, the pre-industrial concentration was about 278 parts per million. In 2005, it was 385. In 2019, three years ago, it was 454 ppm. So you can see we're almost, almost probably by 2030, we will have doubled the concentration of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is what is worrying. Similarly, you can see that we never used to have any of these SF6s and chlorofluorocarbons, etc., man-made chemicals. Now they are in the atmosphere. The PPM is parts per million. The PPB would be parts per billion of particles of air. PPT is the parts per trillion of parts per, of molecules of air in the one volume. And similarly, I won't go into nitrous oxides and CFC-12 and the others, but it is important that you know that some, in some cases, the, we, had, we used to have very small amounts of these uh, gases or no gases of these types in the atmosphere. But today, oh, these gases are there and they are worrying because they will have an impact on the energy balance in the atmosphere. So what do, does this mean? It means, in effect, um, CO2 from fossil fuel and other industrial processes is the largest emitter of ga gases in the atmosphere. If we, take, if we looked at the total greenhouse gases in the period 1970 to 2010. And you can see that the F gases only started occurring about um, 1950s and then, but they, they have grown in significance. 
So each one of these gases is increasing. Probably the only one that is not increasing that much is the N2O, the nitrous oxide. And uh, let's, it doesn't mean it is not important. Like we said, the residence time in the atmosphere is also an important factor. So effectively, therefore, we're looking at either carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel and industrial process and carbon dioxide from forestry and other land use changes. But there's also methane to contend with and the other, including the F gases. So let's go to greenhouse gas and climate change. Now we know what these greenhouse gases are and what it means in terms of residence time, potency, etc. We know, for example, that the increase in the post-industrial era, increase in temperature has been such that for the last 400,000 years, it's the first time we have crossed from the last uh, 650,000 years, it, it is the last, it, it, it is the first time we have crossed this barrier for 300 parts per million. And it is worrying because therefore we need the climate change convention. We need to, because, because once the gases are in the atmosphere, they belong to all of us. There's no boundary, there's no, there's no geographic uh, borders inside or political borders in the atmosphere. The atmosphere belongs to all of us. What happens in your neighbor uh, will affect you. So therefore, we need a global approach to try and address these issues. And we know that uh, there is things we call in climatology natural forcings. So for example, if if, if we didn't have uh, the human activities, nature would cool the atmosphere itself because we have always seen that it does that. We had seen, for example, uh, uh, huge uh, emissions by the volcano Santa Maria, Agun, Alchon, Pinotubo, and others, where we had perturbations in the amount of concentrations of uh, temperature, but ultimately it cools down and comes down again back to normal. But these are the, the difference with the natural forcing is that this is different from what the observations are of what is happening to the temperature of the earth. So, but if we were to consider in our modeling of the atmosphere, put in what we observe with what our models show us, then it, indeed it, there's, there's, a, there's a, an agreement in the models and the observations to say, yes, indeed, there is a natural forcing and an anthropogenic, a human-made forcing on the climate change. So humans are having a, a forcing of their own on the climate. And what does that mean? It means, in effect, therefore, we're going to have an increase in the mean and an increase in the probability of occurrence. So assume that this is temperature at the bottom. You're going to have it in the, what you used to have as normal is going to become hotter, normal. And what you used to have as 10% of a probability of occurrence, that probability of occurrence would increase from what it used to be here to there. So you're going to have more hot weather, more stronger, more stronger winds, more, like, like I say to my students at Climate Change 101, 
Remember, you, can, you cannot destroy energy. You can only turn it from one form to another. So once the earth has warmed, that energy that we, that we report as heat energy will now be turned into more kinetic energy, more, more wind, more uh, in the increase in the intensities are going to be manifested uh, uh, simply because we're having more energy in the atmosphere. Now the other thing, the other thing about about uh, the increase in the temperatures and the temperature um, uh, under global warming is that we can define what we may as a coping range. So I can tolerate, for example, temp uh, warm temperatures. But as soon as it gets very hot, then I start calling it another phenomenon. So for example, if this was temperature on this side, on the, um, on the y-axis, then every time the temperature goes above a certain point, I have to adapt. If it goes below a certain point in winter, I have to adapt. But if it goes beyond that, uh, adaptation mark, adaptation tolerance level, then I become vulnerable. And once I become vulnerable, I may perish or die, whether I'm a plant species or an animal species. And therefore, climate and climate change is what, this is what it's about. That you are going to, we have variations in the climate that will be very soon be unbearable, that will very soon become more than what you can do and adaptation, and therefore you start becoming vulnerable and increasingly vulnerable because the atmosphere, uh, you, the atmosphere will, will push you to a physical limit and there will be economic constraints on the, what is affordable, and there will be also political or social limits to the implementation of adaptation measures. So climate change is no longer just about climate changing, therefore it is about impacts and adaptation and vulnerabilities to not only life, that's plant and animal, but also to social and political and economic uh, issues and horizons. So some of the projected impacts from IPCC reports, for example, there is a sea level rise projected, extreme weather events, impacts on biodiversity, socioeconomic systems, increased water uh, and, and in impacts on, on water availability, uh, and in, in impacts on the agricultural productivity. There will also be uh, disruptions in the ecosystems, in the fire uh, regimes, at pest infestations, in uh, species invasion, a, a risk of floods, risks of heat stress and mortality, uh, vector-borne diseases, impacts on some of these may be irreversible. Uh, uh, I'm sure you've seen um, certain little animals gone uh, that your parents uh, told you about. We're starting to see this, for example, in Botswana. Now, finally, let me just and link for, for you the climate change development and policy. That these are the things that are, will affect us. The droughts, blizzards, flooding, hail, customs, tornadoes, uh, fire, lightning, storms. Now, each one of these is going to affect us one way or the other. For example, in Khaburoni, um, I took the minimum temperatures, average minimum temperatures 
from 1925 to 1995. And it, you and I don't see this, don't feel this, but the minimum temperatures are increasing. We don't feel it because every time it is a little colder, we get, we wear a jacket. But there are other animals that we share um, the, the earth with that don't have jackets. And therefore, this is worrying for them. Now, remember, when we say climate change, we don't mean it is constantly going to increase. There will be certain years when it's is super cool, etc. So don't be, uh, don't be uh, alarmed that although we're talking about global warming, it is not warming all the time. It is climate change that is happening. It changes in the variability, changes in the um, uh, in the peak. Similarly, we, I also looked at the number of what I call stormy days. Storming days, I defined it as the days on which we have 20 millimeters of rain or more. In Botswana, we're a very dry country, about 50 rain days, and about 70%, 80% of those days are less than 5 millimeters, 10 millimeters bracket. So when we have a stormy day, when we have 20 millimeters of rain, whoa, for us, it's a lot of rain. Now, Stormy days, why? 20 millimeters, why? Because it, it, it is a very evidence of the amount of energy that is happening in the atmosphere. So there you are, you start seeing an increase in the number of days that are stormy. The number, of, when, it, when it, instead of just raining, it is going to rain too much one time and those number of days are increasing. It's terrible because you, oh, oh, you might say it's good, but it's, it, it's good for the dams. It's not good for the farmer. For the water uh, uh, bodies collection, uh, water management and the water resource management, it's good because you're getting all of that water run off into a water body and it will be stored. But for the farmer, he doesn't like it that way. So the relationship between earth systems and human systems is such that the changes that we're going to see will be in extreme events, in sea level rise, in temperatures, and in precipitation. And these will have a either impact on ecosystems, water resources, human health, settlement society, food security. I'm only giving you some of the vulnerabilities in here, but you can go on and on, on wildlife, on biodiversity, on many other things that you may be particularly interested in, the fisheries, for example. And of course, if you're going to have impact on any one of these systems, then of course you're going to have an impact in the human systems, governance, consumption patterns, equity, tourism, um, trade, social cultural preferences, etc. So the link between what is happening on the earth and the earth systems here has profound impact on the human systems for socioeconomic development. Largely simply because of what the climate change process drivers, greenhouse gas concentrations are giving us. So it is important that when we negotiate, we have in the back of our mind that we are talking about climate change, yes, of course, but in effect, therefore, we are looking at socioeconomic development. Like we said, the danger is, this is where the temperatures are. We don't know what's going to happen, whether this is going to go straight down, linear, or exponential. We don't know, we don't know yet. But what we do know that is that sometimes you have what we call positive feedback uh, in the climate systems where you have increases in temperature leading to increases in evaporation, leading in, in to more water vapor, more greenhouse gas in there, and hence greenhouse gas effect. And therefore, this would go into until what 
we go into a cycle and uh, 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 of course in climate, then we start introducing concepts like tipping point. It, is there a point where we, there'll be no return? And similarly, you can also have in nature what we call negative feedback. And these can happen simultaneously, you can have positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks. For example, increases in temperature, increases in evaporation, more low, more low clouds, and then more reflection back into space, uh, cooling uh, in temp temperatures decreasing slightly, not sorry, not increasing, but decreasing slightly, I must correct that. Socially, what means, for example, and I'll give an example in, in Southern Africa where we, 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 we practice this, is that in December, right now, in, in about June, July, this time of the year, we are storing our grains. We have just come out of our planting seasons. So come around September, August, September, October, we, we go back to our lands and start fence mending and relocation from the villages into the areas where we plant. And then comes around December, we're tilling and we're eating. This is the time when the marriages are held because there's a lot of food, etc. And then March, April, we're harvesting and it's a cycle of life. This is what a rural livelihood would be uh, in a lot of places in Southern Africa. But look, when we change the climate and there's a delay in the onset of rain, then it means people have to adapt. And these changes of late rains require the farmer to adapt just the timing, etc. It's not an easy thing for the farmer. It's not an easy thing for the goat. The goat will, 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 will try and adapt. The grasses will try and adapt to these changes. And there's a whole ecosystem uh, loading that, uh, that goes into it. And of course, you also have pests and diseases along with that, that are problems to the farmer. So, Climate change is here already. It is affecting farmers big time. Now, why are we worse off? Why should we be concerned as Africa? Because the impacts are worse, because we have a low capacity to adapt, because the impacts are disproportionately amongst the poorest countries and the poorest people. Even in your own city, even in your own country, you'll find that there are poorer people and the poorer people will have mo most vulnerability to climate change than the other guys. When there's no water, the richer guys will go and buy uh, uh, water, but the poor people, where do they go? Where do their animals go, for example? So, but I wouldn't be correct not talking about the climate change skeptics because you're going to meet these people all the time. For example, there are those people that are saying, oh, you know, temperatures are not rising, you are being fooled. Why is it cool today? Uh, yesterday it was very hot, okay, but today it's very cool. So temperatures are not rising, it's just a natural variation, some, some, some just say. Others say, okay, but we understand we don't need to do too much about global about climate change because there's also uh, corona there's also so covid 19 there's also tb there's also hiv aids so then uh, there's other global problems but whatever the issues are i think there is more and more a growing scientific consensus that there is natural variability of climate but something is happening and humans are to blame. So I'll stop here for module one and take a break and uh, take any questions. Thank you.